Good morning and welcome to our Sunday service. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're watching from your living room, your kitchen table, or your tablet. I appreciate you taking the time. If you go to our website, there is a playlist that you can sing along and it will bring you right to the sermon. Thank you also for your faithfulness in giving. A number of you use the e-transfer option or you brought or mailed your offerings into the church. Well, last week we began a series on the 12 disciples. where We're going to look at each individual disciple and see what we can glean from their lives. And today we're going to focus on Peter and his life. And so let's go to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, and read the text. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Gennesaret, it was a small a village on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, just west of Capernaum. Well, there were people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish in their, that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were all astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. So Heavenly Father, we, we bow our heads and our hearts today. And as we focus on the life of Peter, and we see, Lord, how that you uh, called him, how that you shaped and molded him, how you were patient with him, it just gives us such encouragement to know that you are able to use us, that you will be patient with us, and you will help us to grow as well in our faith, that we might be the men and women of God that you are wanting us to be. And so encourage us, I pray, this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we began this series on the 12 uh, disciples, and we looked at Andrew's life, and today we're going to look at his brother, Simon. They were both fishermen, and they were partners and good friends with James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were also become disciples of Jesus. Peter and Andrew grew up in Bethsaida on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, it wasn't very far from Capernaum either, and it seems that they've kind of now settled in this Capernaum area. And more is written about Peter's life than any of the other disciples. And uh, as a result, I think that Peter is probably one of the most loved and appreciated of the disciples by many. He's honest and he's impulsive. He's a man of faith and yet he's a little rough around the edges at times. We first meet him at this shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. They've been toiling all night and uh, they have caught nothing. And yet Jesus says, let's go out once more. I wonder if Jesus knew what he was asking. I mean, they've just finished washing and, and mending their nets, getting them ready for the next day. And now Jesus asks them to go out once again, cast their nets, and if they don't catch anything, then they have to spend all that time cleaning and mending their nets one more time. Well, Simon answers, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, we will let the nets down. Well, I appreciate the fact that Peter is really honest. I don't think he really wanted to let the nets down, but he does so anyway because you said so. And I wonder how often do we hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, asking us to do something, maybe to pray for someone, maybe to go visit someone, maybe to volunteer for something uh, that is a need around us. And, and we're not really all that excited about that possibility either. And so we're tempted to ignore him or maybe disregard him. However, when we do what Peter did, when we obey, not because we feel like it necessarily, but because he asks us, 
Well, that puts us in a position where Jesus can accomplish his purposes in our lives. Well, <clears throat> Peter's reward, of course, was that massive catch of fish. There was fish everywhere. Uh, the, the, the nets were breaking, the boats were sinking, and, and James and John, of course, had to come and rescue them. And, you know, if Peter, if all he cared about was profit, if all he cared about was money, then Jesus has just given him everything that he's longed for, everything that he needs. And yet, you know, Peter understood. He, he had received a miracle, and, and maybe Andrew was right. Remember when Andrew came and said, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought Peter to Jesus? And Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which, of course, is translated Peter. Well, I can just imagine Jesus standing there as he smiles, as he watches his future disciples wrestle, trying to get those fish into the boat. And, and, and something happens to Simon Peter's heart in that moment. Instead of rejoicing in the catch, he suddenly becomes serious and sullen. He knew that he didn't deserve God's favor and blessing in his life. He was aware of the fact that he was unworthy. He was aware of the fact that he was a sinful man. And so when Simon saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and says, get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Now, I don't think he said, get away from me, like we would say to a dog that maybe is barking and we want it to run away. I think he was just saying, Lord, I'm feeling unworthy. I don't know if you're calling the right man or the calling the right person. I, 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 I'm just not maybe cut out for this. And yet Jesus calls him anyway. And Peter, to his credit, follows. He's not going to let this moment get away from him. And I wonder how often we feel totally unworthy to the Lord. We wonder, are you calling the right person? Are you asking the right person? But Jesus calls and he asks anyway. And we just need to respond with faith, not letting that get away from us. When we marvel, how can you love me, Lord? In those moments where we look in the mirror and it's painfully, we are painfully aware of our faults and failings. Let's know that when Jesus calls us, he, he's aware of those things and he understands who we are and, and what our limitations are, but he also understands what our abilities and our talents are because he's placed them into our lives and he wants to encourage us to follow him. And of course, that's the great encouragement from Peter's life. Well, let's see what we see in Peter. Well, first of all, we see that he's a man of passion. It's clear. He served Jesus with passion. And I think it's that passion uh, of Peter that kind of grabs our attention because we want to be people of passion as well. Peter is also sometimes a little impulsive. And, and of course, uh, he speaks before he thinks things through. And of course, we can do that sometimes too. Peter's also a picture of contradictions. You know, at one moment, he just amazes us with discernment and, and faith. And yet at the next moment, we kind of just go, oh, Peter, what, what are you thinking and what are you saying? But we can relate to Peter because he's lovable and yet fallible, kind of much like us. In our hearts, we want to serve Jesus. And, and there's moments where, well, we even amaze ourselves. But then there's other moments where we get our, our pride gets in the way or, or maybe we're filled with doubt or despair. And those are not maybe those moments we would like to forget. But scripture lets us see the real Peter. And lets us see him in those moments where he shines and in those moments where he's not so uh, shining quite as much. It lets us see him grow in his faith and his understanding and his relationship with Jesus. And it lets us see how he began to rely upon, not himself so much, but upon the Lord. I think one of those moments is in that storm on the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples are in the boat, and there's, they're, they're kind of wondering what's going on. And, and all of a sudden, they see Jesus walking toward them on the water, and, and they cry out. They're, they're afraid. They're terrified. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it's you, well, what if it wasn't him? But Peter believed that it was Jesus. And he says, why don't you ask me to come? And I wonder what he was thinking as, as, uh, as that happens. Because Jesus responds, come, he says. And Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. And so here's Peter stepping over the, the edge of the boat and, and he puts his foot down on the water and all of a sudden, instead of sinking, he stands. 
What an amazing experience. And as far as I know, only Jesus and Peter ever accomplished that feat. But when Jesus, or sorry, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, he says, why did you doubt? Peter, you were doing so good. Until then, you began to focus on the wind and the wave. I wonder, what would you have done in that moment? What would I have done in that moment? Would we have stayed in the boat with the 11, or would we have been like Peter and climbed over and, and walked towards Jesus on the water? We've all had times where we've been tempted to focus on the wind and the waves, those impossibilities, the, the obstacles that are before us, and, and maybe by doing so, we have allowed our faith to uh, be diminished a little bit. So Peter's story reminds us, continue to focus on Jesus. Maybe Peter's greatest moment, though, came at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus was asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? And of course, they gave all sorts of answers. John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say, and then Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And without blinking, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replies, and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Well, at that moment, Peter's kind of shown to be a man of spiritual insight in tune with the Spirit. And I wonder if he kind of looked around at the other disciples and gave them a little wink. Uh, and yet, just a few verses later, Peter finds it necessary to rebuke Jesus. He had suggested that the high priest would, would capture him and, and arrest him and put him to death. And on the third day, he would rise from the dead. And so Peter takes Jesus and he, set, and, and he begins to rebuke him. And he says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But instead of thanking Peter for his wonderful insight, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And it makes me wonder, did Peter assume that because he had this marvelous declaration of faith and truth, did he assume then that every thought that he had was also revealed by the Father? And if so, it becomes a, a real powerful warning to all of us not to assume that our every thought, everything that, that comes into our mind is necessarily from the Lord, especially when it comes in direct contradiction to what Jesus has previously said. And that might be the biggest uh, red flag for us. Has Jesus said something? If this is in contradiction, then obviously uh, we are not listening to the Spirit of God, but maybe ourselves. Well, Further contradictions in Peter's life. Remember on that day where, where there was all that fish and he falls on Jesus' knees and he admits that I am a sinful man? And he felt so unworthy in that moment. I think he felt uh, so grateful, though, also that Jesus had called him to follow him. And now in the upper room, he's pretty sure that he would never deny or betray Jesus. Peter asks, Lord, why can't we follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Now, to be fair, Peter did do that in the end, of course, as he died a martyr's death. But in the, in the um, Garden of Gethsemane, he pulled that sword out, and he was willing to fight for Jesus. Remember, he cut off the, the ear of that high priest's servant. But Jesus commanded him, put away your sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And so Jesus was arrested, and Peter, instead of running away, he follows the procession to the house of Caiaphas where Jesus is going to be put on trial. Now it's obvious Peter loves Jesus. He's concerned about what's going to happen to him and he's very interested to know what's going to take place. And yet despite being loyal and pulling the sword out in the garden, something happens there by that charcoal fire where they're all warming themselves that Peter thought would never happen to him. He denies Jesus. When this little servant girl says, I think I recognize you. Aren't you one of his disciples? And isn't that what Jesus had said earlier to him? Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. And of course, Peter said, no, Lord, that's impossible for that to happen. 
But it lets us see that Peter was also a man in need of forgiveness. For Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse uh, 61, that the Lord looked at Peter, straight at him. This is after he denied him the third time. Can you imagine? Then the Lord looks at him. So obviously they must have had some eye contact. And then Peter remembers the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. What's interesting, Judas betrayed Jesus as well. And he was also full of remorse. And yet he couldn't seem to find any hope that he would be forgiven. He couldn't find uh, any, any hope that he would be restored. It was just, just sin was too great in his mind and his heart. And he ends up killing himself. And I wonder, did Satan come to Peter and tempt him with the same solution? Did he say, you know, now Peter, you have denied the Lord. There's no hope for you. There's no chance of forgiveness. There's no chance of, of uh, ever being restored. But we do know that Peter repented. And we do know that Peter found forgiveness. We do know that Peter found hope. There was something going on within Peter's heart and soul that assured him that when he came to God with a spirit of repentance, that God would forgive him. I wonder if he recalled that conversation he had with Jesus a little bit earlier. Remember when Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And of course, Peter thought that that was pretty marvelous. But Jesus answers, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And I wonder now in this moment where Peter is in need of forgiveness, where Peter is in need of, of, of restoration, in this moment where Peter is just distraught because he has done what he never thought he would do, he had denied the Lord. I wonder if he's thankful that Jesus didn't listen to him and just forgive seven times, but 77 times. Or seven times 70. The, the number is, is really a symbol of, of the fact that we are to forgive to an endless supply of grace. And maybe that was why Peter had that hope. Because he knew that Jesus was willing to offer forgiveness as an endless supply of grace. Now before you say, well, I've never denied the Lord like Peter. Or I've never done anything that's put me into prison. So I don't need the grace of God. Let's remember that not one of us can ever say that we've not done something we have regretted. Or we've not said something in our lives that, that we've had to backtrack and apologize for. Herbert Lockyer says, The noblest and purest of men often are tempted by evil thoughts and perplexing doubts. And so instead of arguing that I don't need the grace of God, it might be wiser just to gracefully and gratefully uh, receive it by faith. For the scripture says that as, as it is written, there is no one righteous, no, not even one. But before we throw up our hands in despair and say, well, then there's no hope for me and uh, there's no chance of me being forgiven or restored, let us remember how Jesus encouraged Peter. He said to him in the upper room before they had went down to the garden of Gethsemane, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. You might blow it here, Simon, but your faith will not fail. And when you've turned back, when you've repented, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew that Peter would deny him. And yet he also lets him know that there is hope for him. He will not walk away from his faith. He will not stop loving Jesus. He will not stop uh, serving him but rather would be restored. Well, when Jesus rose from the dead and those women went to the tomb, uh, remember what the angel said to them? Let's read it. They said, don't be alarmed, he said. That's the angel. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He's risen. What a glorious thing that is. He's not here. See the place where they've laid him? But go and tell his disciples and Peter. Interesting that, that the angel singled out Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Let Peter know. Let Peter know what? Let Peter know that he's risen. Let Peter know that there's forgiveness. Let Peter know that there's hope. And even so, even though Peter knew that, there was still this moment of awkwardness that he had when he was in the presence of the Lord. 
And I wonder how often we feel a little awkward in the presence of God. Maybe we've done something that we're so ashamed of, or maybe we've done something that we're disappointed in. And we ask the Lord to forgive us, but, but there's still that moment where we feel awkward with him. And deep down, we know that we're forgiven, uh, but faith can sometimes, and hope can be crowded out by doubt and despair. And of course, that old devil keeps, keeps testing us and, and whispering things into our lives like, oh, your shortcomings will cause you to, to have God stop loving you or, or, or your sin is so bad that it can't be forgiven. There's no hope for you. And of course, we, we hear the devil say that, but we, we need to also know that, that Jesus is able to forgive and restore. Well, the disciples go back up to the Sea of Galilee and they're waiting for the risen Lord to appear. And, and Peter's feeling really anxious. He's feeling antsy here in this moment. And he says, I'm going out to fish. <laughs> Simon and Peter told them. And he said, and they all said, well, we'll go with you. And so they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Well, how frustrating is that? And how, how futile did it feel? It seemed like nothing was working in Peter's life at this moment. He had, he had denied Jesus. Uh, his place of leadership kind of seemed to be uh, teetering. And now all of a sudden he can't even fish anymore. And uh, it's in this moment where Jesus arrives in the early morning. And it's a beautiful reminder to us that in those moments where we feel despondent, in those moments where we feel discouraged, in those moments where we wonder, is there hope? Jesus doesn't leave us there to flounder. No, he comes and he seeks us out. So early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? No, they answered. And he said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, he said to Peter, I wonder if he kind of elbowed him, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard him say that, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. Peter's already repented. Peter's already wept over his sin. However, he's so anxious to be reconciled to Jesus. He's so anxious to make sure that, that there's nothing standing between him and Jesus that it's okay between us. And so he swims ahead of the boats. He doesn't care about the catch of fish. That doesn't matter to him right now. His only concern is that he's in a right relationship with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That miraculous catch must have reminded him of what we read earlier in the, the original text, that day that Jesus called him. Remember, and the boats were so full, and now it seems like it's happening all over again. And, and as he swims with each stroke, maybe he remembers, and, he, and maybe his faith grows because he says, ah, oh, that call is still good. He still wants me to follow him. He could still make me into a fisher of men. Yes, Jesus still wants me. And so he arrives on the shore, and when he does, Jesus has a little fire going, and it's a fire of burning coals to cook up some breakfast. Well, the last time we hear about such a fire was at the house of, Cornel or of, of Caiaphas when they were warming their hands, and he denied the Lord. And, and I don't know if you've smelled a charcoal fire, but it's very distinctive. And it's amazing how smells can bring back memories. And I wonder if when he smelled that, if he remembered the fact that he denied the Lord. And that's something that Jesus is going to address now in Peter's life. And so it's, he had a threefold denial and Jesus is going to talk to him. And there's going to be a threefold affirmation of love. Jesus is going to ask Peter, do you love me? And Peter's going to respond, yes, Lord, I love you. And I think this was difficult for Peter. I think it was challenging. He had to come face to face with his, his failures and his disappointment of Jesus. And yet something outside of him, I think, was freeing inside. So he was freeing as, as he was able then to express his love. He couldn't undo his denial. He couldn't pretend it didn't to, to happen. But he could find grace in the eyes of Jesus. And he could affirm. He could affirm that, yes, I want to serve you. But it's interesting, when Jesus asked a third time, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked that third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Despite my failings, Lord, I still love you. Despite my regret, Lord, I am still devoted to you. Despite my denial, 
I will serve you and I will honor you and I will declare that you are a God who is willing to forgive and, and restore. And I'm wondering, have you ever experienced God's grace? Have you experienced God's forgiveness? Have you experienced God's restoration in your life? Or are you listening to the devil saying, well, your sin is, is, is too great for God to forgive? Listen, Jesus can forgive you. And it all begins, it starts with a prayer, a prayer of faith. It's a prayer like this. And you can pray it with me right now. Dear Jesus, I come to you today and I'm ashamed of my sin. But like Peter, I repent. And I ask you to forgive me. I understand that you might have to help me work through some things in my life just as you help Peter work through his denial. So I'm letting you know, Lord, that I'm willing for you to do that. Because in my heart of hearts, I want to serve you, I want to love you, and I want to honor you all the days of my life. I invite you to be my Savior and my Lord. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, then you become a follower of Jesus. And you can look forward to growing and, and, and learning. And yet, will you make mistakes along the way? Absolutely, Peter did. But just think, God will help you and he'll mold you and he'll shape you. And he'll help you overcome things that you didn't think you could overcome. And you will become a man or woman of God. And that brings us to our last point, that Peter was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, there was 120 of them gathered together to pray, to seek the face of God. And uh, the text tells us in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And of course, this prayer meeting, they were so excited and God was moving and it spilled out into the streets and those who were passing by recognized those other languages. And they said, well, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. And amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Well, some, however, made fun of them and said, well, they have had too much to drink. Well, it's then where Peter stands up and he begins to address the crowd. He who previously was ashamed to admit that he was a follower of Christ when he was asked by that little servant girl now stands before the whole city, basically. Religious leaders boldly proclaiming that Jesus has indeed risen from the dead and that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. He finishes his message off by saying, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Well, the spirit of conviction was just so great that day. 3,000 people were saved that very day. Of course, that's a huge catch of men, wasn't it? And it kind of let us know what Jesus had said earlier. Jesus said, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. You will see souls saved. And of course, what a wonderful harvest of men that were saved as 3,000 were saved that day. And you know, on that day, Peter became the first to bring the gospel of the risen Lord to the Jews. But later, he would be the first to bring the gospel to the Gentiles as he preached in the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And it's a powerful reminder to us, isn't it? that God is able to use us, right? He is able to use us for his glory and his honor, just like he used Peter in that moment and, of course, in the days throughout the book of Acts. God can use us. Be encouraged. Don't be full of despair. And I think that's why we like Peter so much, because he reminds us of the person that we are, but he also reminds us of the person we hope to be. He's honest. He's real. He's sincere. You get what you see. What you you get what you see with Peter, and uh, we always seem to know what he's thinking, even when he's mistaken. And yet, what really shines through is his pure devotion for the Lord. He reminds us that we don't have to wait until we get it all together and our lives are perfect before we can come to Jesus, before we can follow Him. For Peter is called, even though. The, he had some inconsistencies. Even though there was contradictions we saw in his life, Jesus was able to help him overcome those things and, and become the man of God he wanted him to be. We see in Peter that, that Jesus is willing to forgive our mistakes. He's willing to forgive our sins. He's willing to restore us to service. 
And he's not afraid to deal with the issues in our lives, those things that, that we just need to, to work through. Jesus will help us work through those things. But most importantly, he, he kind of shows us that the secret to transformation, finding victory or, or courage in our lives is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. For he is the one, the Holy Spirit, who brings power and courage and wisdom into our lives. In fact, in his letter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter encourages us to live a life that is full of the power of the Spirit of God. He says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promise so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape corruption in this world caused by evil desires. In other words, you can become mature in your faith. And Peter's excited about that because he's come a long way, hasn't he? And it's such encouragement to us that we can be people of maturity, a people of grace, and people that God can use in a powerful way. Tradition tells us that Peter died a martyr's death. He was sentenced to be crucified, but he didn't want to die in the same way as his Lord. And so he says, crucify me upside down. Well, that's tradition that tells us the Bible doesn't tell us that. But it does let us know that Peter is faithful right to the end. And that his life, well, his life can encourage us then. That we can be faithful to the Lord right to the end. That we can be used of God. And that God is able to be glorified in us. So, Father, we pray as we, as we reflect upon Peter's life, we are so thankful, Lord, that, that we see him in his moments uh, where he shined and in the moments that he didn't. And it just encourages us in those moments where, where maybe we didn't get everything right, where despite our bef- best efforts, it just wasn't quite perfect, that you still can be glorified and you can still be magnified. Continue to shape us and mold us Forgive us, pour into our hearts your spirit, and allow us then to be the people that you have called us to be, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.